10th of July uh, 2017 um, and you'll notice that I'm uh, podcasting to you today from a slightly different location. I've decided to move into my sitting room. Um, no real reason. It's a little bit warmer in my bedroom so I, I, it's just nice to have a bit more of a breeze coming in through the French windows here. Um, so uh, hello and welcome and uh, thank you for all those who are returning viewers and welcome to anyone who's a new viewer. Uh, Toby, don't knock the camera please. Mind your head away, that's right. Um, my name is Jared or Peter or Boniface. Um, I'm a former monk, a former bus driver. I live in Abingdon in Oxfordshire in the United Kingdom. Um, and as well as my full-time job, I'm a school governor for, for one of our local primary schools, um, where I chair the Finance, Premises and Personnel Committee, and I'm vice chair of the, the whole governing board. Um, I have been podcasting now for about six months, um, and it's nice to take a bit of a review, really, at this point. Um, I've looked back at some of my old videos and it's, it's quite interesting to, to see the development both in my personal taste but also in um, the things that have interested me during that time. So I began an interest in actually in crochet rather than knitting um, last summer when I was off work for a few months um, because I was unwell. I'm a lot better now but I was quite unwell at the time and it was a good form of um, occupational therapy, if you like. It, it was something I could do that would keep me occupied without taxing me too much. Um, I had learned to knit a very long time ago. Um, I remember making little purses, little coin purses with my mother, Oh, right the way back in the late 1970s, that would have been, uh, with my sisters and older brother. I don't think my younger brothers were involved because they would have been too young, but I'd have been about eight or nine. My sister's slightly older than my older brother, five years older than me. So um, it was uh, fun. Uh, it, was, it was one of those um, things that we did on a rainy sun, summer holiday day or Easter holiday or whenever. Um, it, my mum tried to keep us quite occupied. She herself always... For as long as I've known her, knitted, um, crocheted, uh, sewed, as she made toys for us when we were children as well. Um, and on top of that, my great aunt, her aunt, my mother's aunt, that is, um, was a tailoress. So she would make clothes for, particularly my sisters, but also coats and things for, for the rest of us. So this craftiness has always been part of my background. I loved Blue Peter growing up. The two things I distinctly remember after I'd finished my homework after school, um, even into my mid-teens, all the way through until 16, I distinctly remember loving playing with Lego and Meccano on the one hand and watching Blue Peter on the other. Um, and for anyone who isn't aware, Blue Peter is a magazine programme for children made by the BBC during which um, lots of different activities are, are highlighted that children can be involved in um, or organisations and charities that they work with um, but also children are encouraged to make toys based upon the films or TV or the latest expensive toy on the market from household rubbish, toilet roll holders, um, cereal boxes, that kind of thing. Um, and I always enjoyed that kind of thing, and I did make a few things, and in fact I actually, um, I remember I, I sent a picture to Blue Peter, ooh, about 1980 that would have been, um, on a desalination plant powered by um, sunlight uh, to ease the drought in the Sahara. So even back then, when I, I would have been 11, maybe 12 at the time, it, these were ideas that were... Uh, gaining some traction, uh, still not quite in the mainstream, but obviously mainstream enough that I had heard of it. So it was quite a um, quite a positive so, uh, experience, and I got a Blue Peter badge for that, although it's long since been misplaced. Um, I was actually a very proud Blue Peter badge holder. Ah, 
as a competition runner-up winner. Um, so, kind of closing the circle on that, last summer I started crochet and very much took to crochet. I really enjoy crochet. Um, and after Christmas I decided to teach myself to knit and have it's not quite as strong a love affair with knitting yet, but I think it will probably get there. Um, I do enjoy the process of making, and I enjoy the process of giving as well. Um, one of the nice things about the whole knitting world, the whole crochet, fibre arts, craft world, is that the people who do these things tend to be the kind of people who want to give things to other people. Um, so there's a lot of warmth, a lot of... Uh, care and concern, uh, you know, these, it's nice to be part of a community which is so positive and so affirming and so supportive and which exists almost for the betterment of other people as much as for themselves, which is something I'm very um, keen on myself generally. Anyway, um, to move back to the general outline of this podcast... Um, I have got a finished object. I was worried how to describe this previously because it's actually three finished objects but together they make up a single finished object as it were. Um, and I, I, if I'd only managed to finish one or two of them I wasn't sure if I... I couldn't call them a hoe, would they be a toe, a third a third object, but that a third finished object, a TFO? I'm not quite sure how I would have described them. Anyway. I have the three here, and they are three washcloths uh, made out of 100% cotton um, yarn. Uh, this was the Pegasus Craft Cotton yarn, and it's really, really nice to use. Um, it's 100% cotton from India. It's only 199 for 100 grams, and 100 grams literally made the three cloths. Um, which are more or less 8 inches by 8 inches. This is the smallest, this is the single square, and as you can see it's got a garter stitch border, there's a knit stitch square, and then a, a, a pearl stitch in a square, so it's kind of like a three concentric squares as it were. Um, then the difficulty increased for the next um, one. I have not blocked these by the way. I don't think I will be blocking these, it's more a case of I'll be using them um, and as they dampen and, and get and dry out then the stitches will um, even themselves out a little. So this is the four square block and again it's got a garter stitch border and then there's a, a, a knit stitch and a purl stitch out of square and then corresponding opposite in a square and then the diagonal opposites on the, on the lower. So that's the second square. Um, this was 40 inch, a 40 stitch cast on, this is a 42 stitch cast on, as was the final square, which is a 9 square patch um, cloth. And as you can see, again, you've got the garter stitch border, and I think it goes that way up, that's right. Um, and then you have the uh, pearl bumps outer square and the knit stitch inner square with the opposite in the middle, and then they alternate going down and across and diagonally, it's all very attractive. Um, I, I, sorry, I think, I think, well, it's difficult to know actually. <laughs> I'm going to say, I think I was showing you the wrong side. The wrong side is also a right side, <laughs> so it could be either way, whichever you prefer really. Um, people who've used these, I call them washcloths because some people use them as uh, face or body cloths for uh, washing themselves with, and some people use them as dishcloths. And the pearl bumps apparently are very, very good. They work as a kind of uh, non-scouring scrubby um, for pans and the like. And they have the advantage being 100% cotton that they can be boil washed afterwards. I, I chose the cotton that was natural, undyed, so, um, but you can get them in colours as well. I think they only do black, white, cream and the undyed um, in the Pegasus, but I'm sure other companies do 100% cotton threads. I, I would say that most cotton threads, yarns like this, tend to be uh, between 5 and £10 um, a ball, whereas this is a, 
only two pounds a ball, which makes it a very affordable um, yarn for using uh, domestically. Um, I think also this, one of the things I think that might be possible with these, and I have seen this idea, um, I think it might have been on the grocery girls themselves actually, because I got this pattern via the grocery girls off our needles. Um, that's their Craftsy um, podcast, which comes out on a Friday. Um, they're in their second series now. So the grocery girls themselves, the grocery girls are two sisters from um, Edmonton, Alberta, in Canada. And their family run a grocery shop store and they work in the grocery store and that's why they call themselves the grocery girls. They do a podcast every two or three weeks. Um, and they've been doing that for a couple of years and it's great fun. Um, not least because they have a very down-to-earth, earthy sense of humour, but they're also such nice people. That it, sitting down for an hour and a half podcast with them is like having a cup of tea with a friend. So you sit there knitting with your cup of tea, listening to them, them showing you what they've got, and it's actually very engaging, very entertaining. But Craftsy, which is... Uh, a, a YouTube channel where you can buy tutorial classes and um, on, a, on a range of different crafts. So there's um, Man About Cake, um, to name one, and then there's uh, the Midnight Quilt Show, which is another, which is Angela Walters. Um, sorry about that. It's like Breeze just picked up. Um, so this is the pattern that they recommended, which there are three patterns, in fact, because there's three different types of square but they're all in the same pattern and this is a free downloadable pattern there's a link on the podcast um, which I think is knitting on the go which is the, the the projects you can take away with you if you're going to the beach or if you're going for a drive somewhere or if you're on a bus journey or a train journey so it's small it fits into your handbag or your briefcase in my case um, and you can just take it out for five minutes, do a bit of knitting and then put it away again and, and pick up where you left off. So it's, I can thoroughly recommend both their own podcast and their Craftsy podcast, which is a little bit more, it's not salesy, but it has a little bit more about, it's, it's less about their lives and more about the things they do and how you can do them yourself and, and what it costs and, and where to get the patterns and the inspirations. Um, so it's a little bit more commercial in that sense, which is fine. It's still entertaining. It's still them. Um, and I would thoroughly recommend it. So it's well worth going to the Craftsy YouTube channel and looking that up. Um, so that's my finished object. Uh, sorry, I was going to say, and they recommended, I think it was them, that with these washcloths, you can give them away as presents, either as one or as a pack of three, or you could do different colours of cotton, for example, um, and give them with maybe some bath bombs or bath salts or some other defoliating shower gel or whatever as a present. Um, or indeed, you could give them as a present for the kitchen. Um, and I know it sounds odd to give people <laughs> a, a washing up item as a present, but it's practical it's really they're really nice to touch being cotton they're really nice to touch it was a real pleasure knitting with with the cotton as well um so i i can see that it might work and, and yarn hoarder podcast which is amber linderman um in illinois she also makes dishcloths as presents um gives with, with nice soaps and and other things to family members in particular so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a possibility. Um, I would say on the 100 gram ball of yarn that I used, the cotton yarn that I used for that, I had just less than 12 inch strand left. I wasn't playing yarn chicken because I knew I had enough from the weights. And I knew that by the time I came to the bind, binding off, I would be able to bind off. I had sufficient to bind off. So I, I wasn't worried, but it, it's exactly 100 grams effectively that's gone into these three so there's not much wastage um, now excuse me Toby can you go on there you go um, as part of that um, I used the, the, the recommended needle size for these was four millimeters um, which is what I used um, however I've given my four millimeter circular needles to a friend 
who's watching this podcast, I hope, to use, and I understand that she's actually quite enjoying using them, um, because she wanted to know what it was like. She's never used the circular needles as if they were straight needles before. Um, so I was left having to use straight needles, which actually, given the size of the project, I was quite keen to use straight needles because I don't use them very much and I wanted to get to get used to it. So I started, the first two were done using my Pony 4mm needles. Um, these are metal. I'm not quite sure what metal. I'm not sure it says what metal they are. Um, they're very lightweight uh, and were very good. My only criticism with them was the yarn wasn't very grabby. Uh, being cotton, it tended to be very slick. And so I felt that the knitting was a little looser. My, my gauge was a little looser than it would normally be. Having said that, it is the same gauge as is on the pattern, so it wasn't massively different from where it should be. But for the final one, for the nine square, um, I used or actually a free set of needles uh, with one of my knitting magazines, which is the bamboo 4mm. Um, there's a slight bow in one of them, but it's not significant enough to cause any concern uh, while I was knitting. And I did find that these worked slightly better. There was, because they were, there's more, uh, a, a greater coefficient of friction, if we want to use the scientific term, because they're not as slippy, because they're slightly more grippy, um, I was I was I felt slightly more in control of the size of the stitches I was making and the, the the tension I was able to achieve and the gauge I was able to achieve as a result. So I would just make that. The other interesting thing is that these are considerably shorter than these um, by several inches. So this. I did notice, when I was uh, uh, knitting during my lunch break at work, I did notice that as I, was, uh, as I was using this needle, it was knocking on my desk the whole time, and that was beginning to get really quite annoying <laughs> by the end, um, which has always been my, my one gripe about straight needles. Um, having said that, I use these on my office chair at home, which also has arms, and uh, because because it's not got quite that length, I didn't have quite that issue. This this is about nine inches of usable um, needle. Which, uh, uh, the, yes, the um, cloths themselves are only eight inches wide, but in fact you're never going to have them spread out their complete width on a needle like this because you're always going to have it bunched up towards one end as you're knitting away. Um, but it would have fit quite easily across the whole width of the needle if I'd needed it to. So uh, it was it was um, an interesting experiment. I I think I still prefer my circular needles, just because they they are more the size of my hands, and so there isn't all this hanging out at the end. But this is probably my second option: is the slightly shorter straight needles. Um, I'm not sure that I... I do have a 4, a 4, a 3, a 4, a 5 and a 6 millimeter straight needle set. I don't think I'll be using them very much, um, but they're there in case I need them and it may well be that some yarns are too grippy on, on these straight needles and so it may be that I prefer to have the slightly slippier um, so straight needles. That is my there. only finished object this week. Um, I have, however, cast on my um, first pair of four-ply socks that I'm knitting. And this is, you may recall, the Yellow Brick Road. <laughs> I put a picture of this onto um, Instagram, as I, I do tend to update Instagram during the week, um, at least once a day usually. And a friend at work thought that I had knit um, some kind of bikini bottoms or, or underpants. <laughs> Which I can see, I mean, it, it was slightly shorter, so it was more like that. And I can see that it could look that way when looking straight down. Um, but no, I can assure you they're not. They're, they are, in fact, um, the toe end of a sock. 
Um, I'm really enjoying this little pattern. One thing I have uh, noticed is that the 2.5mm needle that I'm using, um, which is slightly bigger than was recommended, but I think is the right size for my particular gauge, which seems to be matching the gauge of the that's recommended in the pattern. Um, this is quite sharp. Uh, I mean, not not to the point of, of pricking me, but if I, particularly when I'm knitting, not so much when I'm purling, but when I'm knitting, I tend sometimes to just push the the needle back as part of pulling the stitch off. So um, so it'd be like that, needle through, and then pull that off like that. And I was finding that the tip of this finger was becoming extremely sore. Um, I also found that when I'm holding it, this finger, the um, back needle, sorry, the needle I'm knitting on rather, um, which will be the front needle, I've actually got that the wrong way around, I'll, I'll just um, set out the needle so that I can demonstrate what I mean. So, I was finding that this back finger, the, the front needle that I'm knitting from, um, rests just across this part of the knuckle to the, sorry, I've got my hand over here, you can't see, this part of the knuckle to my finger here. And I was finding that that was getting to be quite sore as well. I think it's possibly because um, the, the stitches are themselves so small and I'm working in such my gauge, I think, is actually very good. Uh, as I say, it's definitely the gauge, the pattern. Um, and I'll, I'll just show some of the stitch definition. This this yarn is very good at um, stitch definition. I'm really liking the way it's looking, and I love the the front pattern on the instep. Um, so I find that I, in order to knit, if I if I put a thimble on this finger, I tend I just I just hold this finger out of the way and then use this finger instead. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just transferring the problem from this finger to this finger. So I found that I, if I put a plaster, small plaster on the pad of this finger and then another plaster over here, then I don't have the problems. But it, it does make me look as though I'm, I'm in the wars, as it were, and I'm just knitting. Um, it's just an interesting thing. I'd be interested to know if other people have a similar issue or whether it's just the way I'm, in which I'm holding and using my fingers as part of the knitting process. I mean, I, I find this a very easy pattern to follow. Um, it's a two-line repeat up the instep. It's just stockinette around the back. And it's a very simple five-stitch repeat within the instep itself. So. Um, I think the first row is purl one, knit one, purl two, knit one, and then it's purl one, knit four, purl one, knit four for the second row repeat. Um, so it's it's very much, and you can see it all fits quite happily inside my small uh, knitting, my sock project bag, um, and this fits quite nicely in my um, briefcase. And it's, the, it's a, a very simple pattern, and I, I find I can do this sitting on the bus without any difficulty whatsoever. Um, so this is very much my project on the go. Um, I just have to mention one of my um, viewers, and um, forgive me if I say your name wrong, but I believe it's Wei, um, advised not to use up, because each of these, these are 50 gram balls of yarn, so I'll be using one per sock. Uh, she advised not to use the full ball on each sock because then it would leave a small amount of yarn left over for the purpose of darning if I get a hole in my toe or my heel, which tends to be the two areas where the sock wears out quickest. Um, the, the, they are a 75-25 wool to nylon mixture, I think. No, sorry, this is, a, no, this is an 80-20 wool to polyamide mixture. Um, so it's a, a, a signet, truly rich wool um, blend, which hopefully will give it quite a lot of um, strength 
where it's needed. I think also the, the this um, Judy's magic cast on, which was the cast on used here, which is virtually invisible. I, I, I mean, it's fascinating, really. The the clever people who come up with these um, notions, and it was quite nice learning a new technique. But it, it, it's actually one of the advantages of the, the way in which this has been knit is it's almost reinforced the toe area. Um, so I'm hoping, as long as I keep my nails under control, um, I don't do a lot of walking during my job. I'm, I'm quite office-bound, although there's a lot of walking in the building. I'm not often walking around the building anymore. Um, so I'm hoping there won't be a lot of wear on these socks um, and the more pairs I have then the, you know, the, the, the less often they'll be used and therefore the less wear that they'll suffer but it, I thought it was a very helpful and interesting tip that I wanted to pass on um, to any, anyone who's watching and interested in this kind of thing. It's not something I'd have thought of but now it having been mentioned of course is blindingly obvious. It's such a good idea. Um, so I, I will take that under advisement and I will ensure that I have enough left um, to conveniently darn using the same wool um, should there be any issues. Um, so yes, I, it, it, the one thing I have noticed is it feels like I'm making very slow progress on these. I mean, in fairness, I haven't done them for the last three days because I've been doing the dishcloths, washcloths. Um, but even when I've been working on it, travelling to and from work and, and during my lunch break at work, it doesn't feel as if I'm getting very far. And I think that's probably because I'm using a four-ply yarn and I'm used... My two first pairs of socks were made using an Aran weight, which is three times thicker, and therefore um, fewer stitches per row or round, but also the stitches themselves are much longer, larger, um, and so covered more area quicker. So it's, it's interesting. I'm not getting bored at the moment, which is good, um, because I, with these projects that I undertake, and one of the reasons why I seem to be keen to cast on so many different projects at the same time, is I do have quite a high boredom threshold, or sorry, quite a low boredom threshold. Um, and this sock is, unlike my two iron weight socks, <laughs> The, this sock is uh, a solid colour. It's not even a tonal colour, it's solid. It's the same yellow throughout. So there's no distraction afforded by the changing stripes or the variegations or the tweed aspect or whatever. Um, and it's it's a very, you know, part of the beauty of it is that it is a simple repeated pattern. Part of the obligation of the, the strain of it is the fact it is a very simple and often repeated pattern. So it's getting that balance right. But at the moment I'm quite enjoying working on them, although I'm going through plasters like there's no tomorrow. I know that there are products online um, available for other people who have found doing embroidery or, or knitting projects, excuse me, <laughs> oh, excuse me, it's allergies rather than anything else. Um, I have seen online that um, people buy pads leather pads for fingers because they they suffer from that same uh, problem that if they put a thimble on there they, they find they simply stop using that finger and, and start having the same problems with the middle finger um, but I've not tried any of those yet I, I'm in two minds as to whether it's cheaper and easy just to use plasters um, and so far they seem to be working but I'll let you know if I if I do decide to buy some um, and use them, how that goes. I'm and just going it's to easier pause. to pause. Um, I'm sure you don't want to hear me blowing my nose. Um, so that's my, all my um, finished objects and whips, other than the things that are already still on the go that you already know about. Excuse me a second, it's just plain water today. Um, so I want to move on to um, some other ideas about storage. I don't have any acquisitions this week. I've been very, very good. I have no acquisitions to talk about. Um, excuse me, Toby. Can you just um, move your bottom? There's a good boy. 
So I just wanted to talk a little bit about things that I've previously acquired and that I'm now using and finding helpful. Um, and Bud, getting started knitting socks. This came recommended by the Grocery Girls, by Tracy um, in particular, who is, like me, a book-based person. And I've now, in conjunction with learning various techniques for these new socks that I'm doing, I've now had an opportunity to read a lot of this and um, follow some of the ideas and apply them to the patterns that I'm following. Um, and I have to say, it's an excellent book and I thoroughly recommend it. It's published by the Interweave Press. Um, ISBN is there if you want to make a note of it. Um, Anne Budd is, is basically the queen of socks in America. Um, <laughs> she seems to have acquired that title. Um, and reading her work, I, I, can, I can honestly say, I think she also does, this is, she also does um, a series on craftsy about knitting socks. And her approach is very straightforward, very matter of fact, um, demystifies an awful lot of it, um, encourages encourages you just to sort things out. I mean, you know, one of the things that she talks about is because you sometimes have it when you're making wrap and turn socks, um, you do sometimes have holes in the gusset where you have um, been knitting back and forth and picking up and wrapping and turning and all the rest of it and then you start to knit in the round again and sometimes little holes appear and so she demystifies that it's not the end of the world just get another piece of yarn preferably the same type um, and that's how you fix the hole it's it's not a deal breaker and the fact it's in a book like this is also reassuring because it tells you that other people have also made socks that seem to have little holes in the sides because that's one of the occupational hazards of making the socks in that particular way. So um, I also wanted to talk about the Emerald City socks that I'm going to be making because um, I wanted to talk about this lovely yarn. I, it's very teal looking on the screen which is a shame because it's a beautiful emerald green colour in real life and I cannot describe how beautiful it is to the feel, uh, to touch it. Um, it's a lace weight yarn, um, I mean, there are 800 metres of, of yarn in this, sorry I, I'm I'm sitting slightly to the side, so every, every time I do this, you you can't see what I'm doing. Um, there's it's a uh, it's eighty percent Falkland wool and twenty percent mulberry silk, and it is unbelievably delicious to to feel. But it's also got this lovely jewel quality tone. It it really looks like a, a precious stone. It's got a, a very vibrant feel to it, um, which you can't really see. I'm, I'm, I may be doing a disservice. Sometimes on the iPad, as you're recording, uh, things are you're not getting the colour reflection that is actually visible on the final recording. I don't know why that would be, but sometimes the colours do look slightly altered on the screen as I'm recording. And I'm hoping that this will come out. Um, it's the only... It's the only um, hank of yarn I've got of this um, brand from West Yorkshire Spinners. Um, and where I was saying that the uh, DK yarn can feel a bit crunchy, this just feels incredibly soft and squishy. Um, I'm quite looking forward to getting started on this one. Um, and although it's a lace weight yarn, it uses the same size needles as the four ply yarn that I'm already working on. 
or the uh, Just Follow socks. So when I get started on the Emerald City socks, I might cast this on just to see what it feels like to get using it um, so that I can report back to you next week on what I'm doing. And after that, I promise I will get on with my um, Just uh, um, Somewhere socks, which is somewhere over the rainbow. It's beautiful. Um, 200 grams of um, 7030 superwash merino nylon yarn. It's, I, I can't wait to get using it, but as much because of the vibrancy of those colours. There's, there's just a real energy in those colours. So I'm quite looking forward to getting to grips with all of these socks, but I have to try and stick with the program. I need to concentrate on the thing I'm doing and not jump ahead to the, to the next thing I want to be doing. Um, otherwise I'll never get anything done and I don't enjoy being in the moment as much. And One of the things about knitting I found is, is I think the modern... Excuse me a second. I think the modern term for it is mindfulness. Um, in Catholic spirituality, it's what's known as living in the present moment, which isn't the same as living for the moment, but it's about not worrying about what has been and not worrying about what will come, but dealing with what is here now um, and getting that right and enjoying that. And so knitting to some extent should give you that experience because you are absorbed in the thing that you're doing and it also is certainly for me a way of reducing distraction so that I can concentrate better on the other thing whether it's someone speaking to me or whether it's the TV or the radio or whatever it is I'm listening to um, and so it, it's a, it's a little odd that I have to really talk to myself and say, you know, come on, stick with the projects you've got, get those finished, enjoy the process that you're involved in with those things. And as I said before, I am very much a process crafter rather than a, a product crafter. I tend to make the thing and then think what I can do with it. Not always, but quite a lot of the time. Um, so it's... it's um, it's a, it's a good day, so today was the perfect day to record, but unfortunately my allergies, uh, I suffer from hay fever, and it's often fine, but then suddenly for a couple of days it just, ugh, and then it all disappears again. Um, so I'd, I'd not taken any tablets for a few days, actually for about a week, for the, for the hay fever, so maybe I need to get some more. Um, I was hoping to avoid it, because I don't like to take more medication than I actually need to take at any given time, but at the same time it's, I'm getting quite nasally again. So, um, the, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is a storage issue. I think I've mentioned before that I keep my scraps of yarn in these storage jars, and they look very pretty actually with the multicolours. Um, but I also find that because I've done that, they can get because you can't quite tie a proper cake, a rope, wind a proper cake, and then there are just small scraps of bits and pieces, that where I did have slightly more, say 10 or 15 or 20 grams of, of yarn, which would be useful in a scrappy project, um, as opposed to just a very small amount as these are, which might be useful for bits and pieces in amigurumi and that kind of thing. Um, I was not really using what I had, so I decided to separate out my two bottles of yarn that I have, the yarn scraps, and these are the ones that are less than, um, I think eight, eight grams was the smallest I had, um, but these are, these are all much less than eight grams, these are all less than five grams in fact. And then with the others I decided to um, convert them back into hanks. And one of the reasons I did that is because actually I quite like the hank feel. Um, there's something quite... I don't know what it is. It, it just feels 
more special than just a small amount of a cake um, of yarn. So even the, the, the smallest amounts, just they, I think they just have more presence when they're wound into hanks. And it's a very simple process to wind into hanks. Um, I just get my um, quilting ruler, which is 6 inches wide, but is 24 inches long, so that's 2 foot long. And then I just, starting with, with a small amount at the front, I then just wind around and around and around and loosely tie the two ends around the hanks, the, um, the strands rather, and then you twist them, twist them, twist them, and eventually you get them to twist up and store them in, in this. And so I've got probably uh, eight or nine. Um, the, the largest hank I've got I think is 30 grams. Most of them are about 10 grams. Uh, a couple of them are 20. Um, and the, the 10 gram hanks or a hank of uh, 10, 10 grams of, of yarn. Um, when I've got enough, I think I will start a scrappy blanket. Um, a memories blanket, as it were. Because it becomes very easy then to... Uh, you probably need about 7 or 8 grams to, to knit a square. Uh, what, 4 inch square? Um, Four inches, so sixteen inches altogether, four inch by four inch square, um, and I've got plenty to start with, um, and they'll just be entrelac style squares. And I, I may knit some, I may crochet some. I've, I've not seen anybody mix the two together, but I can't really think of any good reason why you couldn't have a mixture of granny square and Tunisian entrelac square, and then the knitted square as well. Um, and it just changes the texture, and, and you know, I, I think I'll give that a go. And the advantage that that has is that you're doing small squares, um, and it's one of those things that you can, if you if you finish a project like I finished the um, the the washcloths last night. Um, I could have then got this out. I didn't feel up to it last night, so I didn't bother. But I could have started my first square because I wouldn't necessarily want to get into something that's going to be a large project. It's going to take a few weeks or a couple of months even. But it might be something that just fills an hour or so um, of spare time um, in between finishing your project and moving on to one of your other items that you may not want to get stuck into right now. Um, so that's that's what this is. So that's so I have my two storage solutions, as it were. Um, one is Hanks, and the other one is just small. So bolts. I think then we move on to the recommendations part of the podcast. Um, Doctor Who finished last week. The ending wasn't quite what we were expecting in one way, which is always good. Um, there was a very interesting aspect to the final episode, which was the fact that, um, like the Doctor, the Master is a Time Lord and therefore has different incarnations with regenerations at the end of the natural lifespan of the particular incarnation. And we had two incarnations of the Master. And the Master being, if the Doctor is the um, embodiment of all that is good in the universe, then the Master is the embodiment of all that is evil. And so rather inevitably, but rather beautifully in another way, um, the Master ends up stabbing himself literally in the back um, before shooting himself in the back. And I, I was very pleased that they decided to go there with the characters because it was actually the only satisfactory ending that that character could actually have in my opinion. But more importantly, for the um, future of the programme, uh, the Doctor uh, is refusing to regenerate because he doesn't want to change who he is to become yet another person. Um, and we stumbled across, well, the Doctor stumbled across himself in his first incarnation. Um, 
William Hartnell played the original Doctor Who, 1963 to 1966. And then he revisited the role in a one-off special for the 10th anniversary before he died in the mid-1970s. I think he had motor neurone disease or something similar. Um, in, for the 20th anniversary special, uh, second actor Richard Herndl played the first Doctor. Um, and now Alan Bradley, who is probably more famous as Mr Finch, is it? The um, caretaker at... Hogwarts School of Magic um, in the Harry Potter books has not quite reprised his role. Um, for the 50th anniversary special, the BBC made a pseudo documentary, a drama documentary, if you like, about the makings of Doctor Who, of the how Doctor Who came to be. And so Alan Bradley actually played William Hartnell playing the Doctor. <laughs> um, but now he's been cast in the main series as the first Doctor, making the first Doctor actually quite unique. He had previously um, been the only... No, I don't think he had. No, I'll tell a lie. There had been a second actor playing Patrick Troughton's Doctor in one episode when he was ill with measles um, in the late 1960s. So Alan Bradley makes the first Doctor the first character to actually be played by three different actors. And I guess we're just kind of used to the idea of different actors playing the same character on television now, even within the same programme. Um, uh, we've seen it on soap operas, uh, both domestic and foreign, where an actor is, for whatever reason, no longer available or persona non grata on set, and so they just recast the, the, the character with the same actor. Um, with Doctor Who, it had been rather different in that the same character changed. So that the character of the Doctor, although the, the fundamental goodness of the Doctor was always the same, the personality traits, the, the way in which he behaved, altered. The, the actors were not meant to play the Doctor in the same way as, as he had previously been played, so they, they brought something new to the role every time. And that tradition has continued. All of the Doctors are sub substantially different from each other. Um, so it's a little more unusual to have different actors coming in to play the same version of the Doctor. Um, I'm quite looking forward to the Christmas special because I, I think Alan Bradley has captured the whimsical nature of William Hartnell. William Hartnell was always described as the crotchety old man, but if you actually watch some of his episodes, particularly in the second season when he was at the height of his powers, having embedded the character and, and really understanding the nature of the show, um, and particularly in stories written by Dennis Spooner, who was of the kind of Douglas Adams of the 1960s, um, he has a really well-developed sense of humour uh, he, he, and a sense of fun. So I'm, I'm quite looking forward to see what Alan Bradley brings to the role, because already he seems to have brought that sense of the twinkle in the eye um, that the character had. Anyway, so Doctor Who is now off the air until Christmas. Um, and The Walking Dead won't return until October, but to bridge the gap, I have Game of Thrones starting, I think, uh, next week. So that would be July the, the week of July the uh, 17th onwards. Um, I'm not exactly sure which day. I think it's probably Monday, but um, I will have to double check that. But um, So we'll get to see what happenings in Westeros and how will Jon Snow and the rest move towards the final denouement and who will win and what alliances will be forged and which alliances will be breached and who will betray whom and who will survive if anyone um so i'm quite looking forward to that so um that's that's the big kind of program coming up to be interested in um so i wanted to finish with a book recommendation which is slightly left field for me in, in one sense to use an american um, sporting analogy. Um, Bernard Cornwell is a 
Well, he, he kind of writes romance fiction, but not romantic fiction, if you see what I mean. It's more about that kind of high medieval chivalry um, and the battles and, and the consequences. But he doesn't write it from the point of view of the rich and the powerful. Um, so just to give the background, the, <coughs> the basis of this book is the Battle of Cressy. And the Battle of Cressy is much less well known than the Battle of Agincourt. Um, Agincourt happened, what, 25th of October 1415, um, at the height of the War of the Roses, uh, Joan of Arc and all that, um, which is a very 1066 and all that kind of approach to history. Every English schoolboy would have known about the Battle of Agincourt, 1415. Um, and it was the, 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 the major battle when the English longbowmen overwhelmed the French cavalry. Because French cavalry up to that point had been the invincible tanks of medieval warfare, but the English longbowmen came into their own at, at um, Agincourt. Um, not least because, although um, the French had uh, crossbows, crossbows take, because you have to ratchet back each bolt you load, it takes several seconds, maybe as much as 45 seconds, to reload a crossbow, whereas it takes the time it takes to pull an arrow out of your quiver and reload, so maybe 10 seconds to load a longbow. And the range of the longbow is significantly greater, because it's all about the potential energy stored in the wood um, that bends back as you pull the... And the uh, so the Battle of Agincourt is well known. The Battle of Cressy in 1430, sorry, 1346 is much less well known, but is actually probably more significant in the in the, the Battle of Cressy, which was the first time that the Plantagenet kings had stood up to the French king, who was technically their liege lord, because they were the Dukes of Normandy, Counts of Anjou, and the like, which are regions of France and therefore are vassals of the French state. But they're also of well, the French king, but they're also in themselves independent kings in England. So there, there was always this tension between the English and the French crowns, and the French kingdom being the great prize because it it was the biggest kingdom in Christendom, um, outside of the Greek Empire. It was um, the, the Battle of Cressy was significant because it kicked off the Hundred Years' War, of which the Battle of Agincourt was probably the most famous battle. Um, so, there are three books in the series, um, Harlequin, Vagabond, and Heretic, and it follows the fortunes of a longbowman, Thomas of Hookton, whose father himself fought in, I think his father fought in the Battle of Cressy, um, and it's no, his father fought in a previous battle, because this, this book ends at the Battle of Cressy. And it's called the Grail Quest, because it's part of the idea that the Hundred Years' War was part of the search for the Holy Grail and that kind of thing, um, which is a, 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 an occultist um, fascination. And I use occultist not in the sense of black magic, but in the sense of magic in any sense. That it's, it's a stu superstition that... Under, is underpinned by a theological belief, but it's still a superstition that the object itself has powers to grant um, victory in battle and it, it, perpetual youth and all this kind of nonsense, which, which is superstitious claptrap. The Holy Grail being, of course, the Sang, sang Real um, in Spanish, which is the Holy Blood, the Royal Blood, rather, which in French becomes saint Graal, so the G moves from the Sang to the Real, and then becomes the Holy Grail, because Saint means holy and Graal means Grail, but Grail doesn't mean anything. Um, so it, given that the Catholic theology of the Eucharist is that the priest converts the water and wine into the precious blood of Christ at every sacrifice of the Mass that's offered, it's unclear why um, a particular cup that may have held may have been used at the original celebration of, of Mass, the Last Supper, has 
powers in and of itself to grant anything. Um, it's it is a it's very much the uh, a product of the medieval superstitious mind rather than any any dogmatic theological basis. Um, but it's 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 quite a good um, it it's that that kind of occultism that kind of superstition attached to objects is something that we share even to this day in common with our forebears. We we may have made many scientific advances and understand our world a lot better in scientific terms, but there's still a clinging to the idea that objects possess powers and authority and, and can grant powers and authority to individuals, um, which is the true meaning of occultism rather than necessarily black magic and satanic masses and all that kind of palaver, which is a palaver. Um, it's blasphemous, but it doesn't have any power in its own right. Anyway, one of the important things about this is that it, they're very good descriptions of battle scenes, and I know that sounds rather gory, but actually I went to the British Museum not long after reading this for the first time and was able to look at the Babylonian stele that are in the British Museum and that cover whole walls showing battle scenes, and the battle scenes being described there from, say, 2000 BC, 1500 BC, 500 BC, were exactly the same as they were in 1500 AD, give or take a hundred years. And I, I, I thought that was fascinating, that really those worlds shared a lot more in common with each other than we share with them, even with our most recent forebears, in that respect. And it's, there was a certain uh, dignity and quality to warfare which perhaps has been lost. The Age of Chivalry, the, the Hundred Years' War was significant in that it saw the rise of the Age of Chivalry with things like the Battle of Cressy, and then the fall of the Age of Chivalry with things like the Battle of Agincourt. Um, chivalry being coming from the French chevalier, meaning knight, or horse rider, um, and the cavalry being overcome at the Battle of Agincourt um, by the English bowmen. And it's interesting, actually, um, one of the things it mentions in here that I hadn't really thought about, but which is true, um, you don't find yew trees in farms, you only find yew trees in graveyards. And the reason is, yew trees are poisonous to cattle, but are essential for longbows. And so the church provided the wood that was then turned into longbows by, for the use by the archers. So that's an interesting aside, which I didn't know, but actually thinking about it makes perfect sense. Anyway, so I think I've burbled on long enough <laughs> this week. Um, I hope I will have more to show you next week, um, and I'll give you some updates on, perhaps I'll have cast on the... Emerald City Socks. Um, I apologise for the stopping and starting for the nasal um, inflections, but uh, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a martyr to my allergies, I'm afraid. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and you'll receive an update for when I next upload a video, which will be about a week's time, I would imagine. Um, and if you like this video, please hit that like button. Thank you for spending some time with me, and I will speak to you again soon. Bye.